Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, three Mississippi counties are getting help to repair their farm to market roads and bridges. Farmers across the U.S. face challenges from fire and flood. In Southern Gardening, gardening on a budget, you don't have to spend a lot of money on bedding plants. In Food Factor, eat less and eat right in, the, in a restaurant. We'll have some tips. And the markets hold off pricing cotton at this time. And if you're selling corn off the combine, you should do it now if you can't store it. In the feature segment, the Great Mississippi Tea Company. This Brookhaven farm is making plans to grow one of the world's most popular beverages. It's a site rarely seen in the United States. All tea comes from the same plant. So if you have black tea, green tea, oolong, yellow, uh, white teas, they're all the same plant. It's just how you process it. But what we're aiming for is really some high grade special or specialty tea. Good day everyone, I'm Amy Taylor. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. Rural residents in three southwest Mississippi counties will benefit from a federal grant. Amy, roads and bridges in the three counties will see $18 million in improvements. It comes through a cooperative program that seeks to improve farm to market roadways. Mississippi Public Broadcasting News reported earlier this week that almost $18 million will go to repair roads in Claiborne, Franklin, and Jefferson counties. It's from a cooperative program run by the U.S. Department of Transportation and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The Mississippi project goes by the name Tri-Mississippi. More federal dollars are also coming to Mississippi in the form of conservation innovation grants. The USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service made the grants to Delta Farm and the Holmes County Food Hub. The grantees must provide 50% of the project's total cost. The hub will receive just over $640,000. The Holmes County Food Hub started last year. It assists small farmers with marketing their produce to Mississippi schools and other buyers. The hub also works to promote new technologies which can be of use to small farmers such as subsurface irrigation. Delta Farm will receive almost $439,000. Farm stands for Farmers Advocating Resource Management. It helps farmers and landowners by providing technical information and help or helping farmers install and maintain conservation practices. Farmers always have to expect the unexpected when it comes to weather or natural disasters. If you're feeling down about your situation, chances are it's worse for someone else. Mike Pearson of Market to Market reports on the variety of trials facing the nation's farmers. In Hawaii, Lava from one of the world's most active volcanoes continues its slow but steady creep, nearing rural homes on the Big Island. While Kilauea has erupted continuously since 1983, scientists warn if the current trail of magma continues its course, it could lava lock the town of Pahoa within two weeks. Though rain over the flow site dampened wildfire threats, some livestock owners decided to err on the side of caution. We removed all the cattle. Yeah, about uh, almost 55 heads. While many residents of the Aloha State accept such events as the price of living in paradise, a wide range of meteorological extremes ran scattershot over the southwest this week. And prolonged drought has jeopardized green chilies, a valuable crop for one mountain state. They have been here, integral part of the diet, uh, part of the art, it's part of the culture, you know, practically part of, um, part, part of our soul here in New Mexico. And uh, it would be a great tragedy if we lost the chili industry here in New Mexico. Amidst parched conditions and worker shortages, the Land of Enchantment's love affair with the green chili is getting pricey. Last year, 8,600 acres were dedicated to the beloved veggie, just a quarter of the land devoted to the spicy peppers two decades ago. 
And with the mighty Rio Grande running at record lows, growers have turned to well water to keep the regional staple alive. In contrast, seasonal monsoon moisture combined with the remnants of Tropical Storm Norbert this week to dump rain throughout the desert southwest. Flooding engulfed the Moapa Valley 50 miles north of Las Vegas and wreaked havoc on interstate highways in the surrounding area. But the Grand Canyon state endured the most dramatic departure from normal conditions. Following rain and dust storms, a single day record of more than four inches of precipitation hammered Arizona's La Paz and Maricopa counties, prompting a statewide emergency. Residents were baffled by the intensity of the storm in the arid desert. When you buy a house, you sign your, your paperwork for the mortgage. When they say insurance, they look at flood insurance. You're not on a flood zone. You don't buy flood insurance. It's why spend money on something that is never supposed to happen. Despite the epic downpour, surging floodwaters have state officials in doubt as to whether Arizona will experience any lasting relief from chronic drought. Eating out at a restaurant can be a difficult task if you're trying to lose or not gain weight. In this week's Food Factor, Natasha Haynes of the Mississippi State University Extension Service gives us some tips on eating out and eating healthy. I love going out to eat, but sometimes I worry about the calories. With planning, eating at a restaurant doesn't have to be fattening. Before going to a restaurant, go online and check out the menu or call ahead and ask questions. No matter where you eat, always choose baked, broiled, roasted, steamed, or grilled entrees instead of fried foods. At Italian restaurants, look for red tomato-based sauces and dishes labeled primavera, which means they include vegetables. Always avoid white cream sauce such as Alfredo and don't fill up on the bread. At Mexican restaurants, choose soft tacos over hard tacos and grilled chicken over beef. While salsa is low in fat, the chips aren't. Go easy on the cheese. A standard American favorite is the hamburger when going out. For a healthier option, try a turkey or veggie burger instead of beef. And don't forget to add my personal favorite, a juicy slice of tomato. Restaurants sometimes serve large portions, so plan on splitting the entree with a friend or have the wait staff make half of the entree to go. Next time you go out to eat, enjoy time with family and friends. Remember to look for healthier food options. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Natasha says some other ways to stay healthy at a restaurant is to drink water and steer clear of those desserts. Do you want colorful flower beds but don't have the money to buy plants for every change of season? In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman says with the right plants, you can have a great looking garden for less money. There are times when planting in the landscape is constrained by the gardener's budget, but that doesn't mean the landscape has to be plain and boring. A big expense of gardening comes from buying mass plantings of bedding plants every year. But the budget-minded gardener doesn't have to do that. There are plenty of flowering perennials that will reward you with bright color year after year, like this Victoria Blue and Victoria White Salvia. But the budget gardener doesn't need to rely totally on perennials. There are some annuals that will reseed for you. New Look Celosia has four inch flower plumes that are bright red, which complement the red tinged leaves. Ground covers fill a lot of space with very few plants, and you can't beat ornamental sweet potato for striking and vibrant color. The chartreuse margarita is bright and will aggressively fill open landscape areas. Can you believe there are only three plants in this planting? Rose moss portulaca also serves as an effective and drought resistant ground cover spilling over the rocky border. Larger specimen plants also add a visual spice. 
the black diamond crepe myrtle has very attractive black leaves along with masses of vivid bright red flowers. Elephant ears add massive green texture. And of course, every Mississippi landscape needs some knockout roses. This hardy and nearly carefree plant provides reliably plentiful flowers all season. By choosing plant material carefully, you can keep your flower beds bright and beautiful on a budget. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Victoria Blue Salvia can be grown as a perennial along the coast areas of the west coast and in the milder climates of the south. In our feature segment today, the Great Mississippi Tea Company. This Brookhaven operation plans to grow a premium tea for you to drink. And Leighton Spann is not with us, so Artis is going to handle the market segment this week. And Amy, end of last week, the September crop production report was new, so this week the market's been digesting the numbers. In the headlines this week, OA Cleveland says cotton farmers should not price their cotton at this time. FAPRI lowers its estimates following the September crop production report. Live cattle futures slip some, but they are expected to recover by year's end. Well, the market did spend most of the week digesting the September crop production report from the USDA. USDA lowered its U.S. cotton estimate by 1 million bales. The domestic use estimate remained unchanged, but unfortunately the export number was dropped as well. Cotton marketing expert O.A. Cleveland recommends that farmers do not price their 2014 crop right now. Cleveland says the indications are that exportable supplies of cotton outside of China continue to decline. The stocks of quality cotton in Australia, Brazil, and the U.S. continue to decline. USDA has also admitted that its estimates of China's cotton purchases was too low. All that being said, Cleveland says that cotton farmers should wait to price. They should wait for December futures to hit 70 cents before pricing. Once this rally starts, it could extend to 72 cents. Well, meanwhile, the Food and Agricultural Policy Institute has lowered its soybean and corn estimates after the report. Like many, FAPRI looks for the USDA's numbers to keep going up in the crop reports to come. FAPRI lowered its season average corn price to $3.50 a bushel for the 2014 crop. That's down 39 cents from last month. It looks for the 2015 crop to average 380. The 2016 to 2020 crops may average 401. Turning to soybeans, FAPRI's projected price dropped to 30, dropped 38 cents per bushel to 992. It looks for the 2015 crop to average 904. The 2016 to 2020 average is expected to be 1021 per bushel. Well, what is ahead for the U.S. crop situation? The old adage goes that big crops get bigger, and that seems to be running true to form this fall. The feeling is, is that the USDA is going to continue to raise the cotton yield. Tom Fitzenmeyer says, if you can't store your cotton, your corn, I should say, sell it now. USDA's crop numbers are going to get worse. I think each, each, each successive report, I think, is going to increase in, right into the final. If you look at back at fundamentally similar years, we tended to uh, have a, 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 a much more substantial increase in, in yield as we went into the final, and, and I don't see this year be, being any different from that. Well, September is National Rice Month in the United States, and today our question is about rice. This question is akin to the one about how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. We want to know... How many grains of long grain rice are there in a pound of rice? Is the answer 5,600, 8,500, 16,000, or 29,000? I'll have the answer at the end of the markets. We're going to pause now for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the rest of the markets. Artist Ford reports that live cattle futures are retreating, but they're expected to rise again by year's end. In the feature segment today, the Great Mississippi Tea Company of Brookhaven. It's planting the plants that will eventually produce premium tea. From our family to yours, Mississippi's farmers believe the best produce and livestock are grown right here at home. With ms.foodsearcher.com, you're only a click away. Using your smartphone, you'll be connected to hundreds of families and small businesses dedicated to providing you with fresh local foods. Produce, meats, fish, dairy, agritourism, community markets, and more are right at your fingertips no matter where you are. ms.foodsearcher.com. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the farm week calendar. 
The Mississippi State University Extension Service is holding a wild hog control workshop on Thursday evening, September 25th. The location is the Monroe County Extension Office on Highway 145 North in Aberdeen. You'll learn about wild hog biology, behavior patterns, and how to trap them. Please register by Tuesday. We'll have the number on our Farm Week website calendar. The annual Ag Lenders Workshop will take place at two locations starting next month. The first will be held Wednesday, October 15th at the Grenada County Extension Office on Fairground Road in Grenada. The second is Thursday, October, November 6th at Lincoln Civic Center on Beltline Drive at Brookhaven. Online registration is available. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now, let's check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. Turning to the beef cattle sector, cattle futures have backed off some, but many believe that the fundamentals in the market are good. While there is resistance at the 160 per pound range, consumer demand for beef is good, even at these high prices. While live cattle futures may drop some more, Tom Fitzenmeyer looks for strength going into the end of the year. We rallied October cattle up to about 160, D up in a 162 plus or minus range, which was kind of the resistance it ran into the last time, and boom, we ran, ran into resistance again this time. So I think you're up at levels where it's gonna be a little tough. I, I, it appears to me that the consumer ha has, has sort of adjusted to these higher prices and said, okay, I like steak, I like my hamburger. If I have to pay a little more for it, I guess that's what I'm gonna do, because demand has really held up qu quite well, I think, and export demand has held up. And the demand for protein around the world is high, so um, on the demand side seems to be okay. Now, we're probably going to sag a little bit into October. I wouldn't su be surprised at all to see a little pullback here, and then possibly by, by the end of the year go back and retest those highs again, and maybe even take them out. Now before our new feature story today, let's check the trivia answer for this week. How many grains of rice does it take to weigh one pound? Well, the correct answer is D. The U.S. Rice Producers Association says it takes more than 29,000 grains of long grain rice to make up one pound. And another thing to remember about, remember about rice, it's naturally gluten-free. In Brookhaven, Mississippi, two ambitious entrepreneurs are going where no grower has gone before when it comes to commercial tea production. Jason McDonald and Timothy Gibson started the Great Mississippi Tea Company in 2012 and their first crop shows great promise in producing high quality tea. The two have consulted the Mississippi State University Extension Service and other experts in their venture and look forward to offering locally produced fresh tea products for consumers to enjoy. Freshly brewed tea has been a beverage of choice in many cultures for thousands of years. It can be served hot or cold and comes in pretty much any flavor to suit your fancy. Tea has been used as a sleep aid, stress relief, and even for doctoring sunburn. It's a staple item at social gatherings, particularly in the South. And after a hard day's work in the hot sun, a nice glass of iced tea is hard to beat. In Brookhaven, Mississippi, Jason McDonald and Timothy Gibson decided to launch the Great Mississippi Tea Company, where they grow camellia plants for making tea. Jason McDonald tells the story behind this crazy idea. Well, after Hurricane Katrina, we uh, lost a lot of our timber in Walthall County, and so we'd been looking for a crop that would would stand a hurricane. And we were on vacation in Charleston in 2002, and we saw the Charleston tea plantation. So we uh, went to, or decided to take a visit. So we went out there, and they said that it was a camellia, needed high heat, humidity, and acidic soil, and uh, ample rainfall. And I said, well. Sounds like we found the crop, so we called up Rebecca Bates, our extension agent, and said, we've got this crazy idea, will it work? <laughs> and she said, well, we'll try. I was thrilled. My background is horticulture, so I knew that tea came from a camellia plant. I knew that we grew camellias very well in Mississippi and in Lincoln County, but I really didn't know um, about the process of growing tea, the culture of tea. 
I didn't quite understand how it was harvested. The soil type it needs is, is a good sandy loam. Uh, it needs an acid soil and we certainly have plenty of that here in Lincoln County. Bates says the soil was sent to the soil testing lab at Mississippi State University Extension Service to be analyzed for nutrient levels and determine if anything needed to be added, such as lime or fertilizer. This service is available to all Mississippi landowners who can send dirt samples to the lab for analysis and recommendations. Co-founder Timothy Gibson explains more about getting started. We had to build planters because of uh, drainage issues. We've had to cut in different uh, drains to get the water away, uh, have everything potted over from little pots to big pots, uh, planting bigger plants in the ground um, so that we can take cuttings from them later. For irrigation, a low voltage system is used which comes on automatically each day and has a built-in fertilization system. Additionally, Jason McDonald explains the need for the shade cloth. When the plants are as small as they are, if they go in full sun, it can burn them back and kill the plants. It's also important because when it gets 108 degrees with heat index, it offers a little bit of shade for the cooler weather. It's also the irrigation comes on at the hottest part of the day, so the mist and, and the shade together, it actually will cool off the area about 20 degrees. The tea company has a total of 30,000 plants. And at two years of age, the oldest portion of the crop is still a year away from harvest. Timothy Gibson explains the harvesting process. You have hand processing and mechanical processing. Um, hand processing is exactly what it sounds like. You have people that get out there and they pluck the first two little leaves and the one little bud that's coming up. They pluck it off, throw it in a basket, uh, then it gets laid out so that it can lose a lot of moisture. And then it gets broken up and let oxidize and that's where it turns brown. Mechanizing does the same thing. Additionally, Jason McDonald describes the company's goals after harvesting the plants. All tea comes from the same plant. So if you have black tea, green tea, oolong, yellow, uh, white teas, they're all the same plant. It's just how you process it. Then you can add flavorings on top. It's wildly popular in the United States with the flavorings, primarily because there's a lot of chlorine chemicals in our water, so it's kind of masking those bad tastes. But what we're aiming for is really some high-grade special or specialty tea that uh, some things would be cold brewed so you still get the flavors. Uh, flavorings around the world are not really sought after, but we will have a line of tea bags and things for American use that would be flavored and We'll also have orthodox and bulk tea. McDonald hopes to harvest an experimental tea crop by 2015, then offer small batches to limited customers in 2018 and ramp up to full production by 2020. He says they want to use a mechanizing process for harvesting that doesn't sacrifice the quality that hand processing would produce. Another goal is to reach out to the community. We think we've got something that's pretty unique and people want to come out. We've got some plans to uh, talk with retired teachers and getting some lesson plans drawn up for school groups. Uh, we'll also offer wedding space, meeting spaces. Uh, we'll do tea uh, processing workshops where people can come out and pick the tea by hand and make the tea so it's something special they can take home. Uh, we'll have farm tours, hopefully. I'm all about farmer's market, so I would love to see it become a farmer's market product. These type products could be sold uh, at the market by the pound or just in small quantities. Uh, I would hope to see eventually that he could actually bottle some, some teas, uh, some chai teas. Finally, Jason McDonald says in addition to guidance from MSU Extension Service, they were blessed to receive advice from tea consultant Nigel Mellican of the United Kingdom, as well as a grant from the Mississippi Department of Agriculture and Commerce. Until 2020 rolls around, we'll have to wait patiently before we see how the tea turns out. From Brookhaven, Mississippi, I'm Amy Taylor reporting. You can watch the story on The Great Mississippi Tea Company on our Farm Week website, Facebook page, or YouTube. We'll also have the contact, website, and Facebook information for the company. Our website address is farmweek.msucares.com. We'll also be available at twitter.com slash farmweek.
Well, Amy, what was one of the most fascinating things you learned while you were there? I thought it was really interesting that actually the tea plants, when they're very, very young, their roots are tender and they kind of come up out of the ground some. And so when you're walking, you can actually kill one. Really? <laughs> yeah. And of course you saw they were kind of babying the plants under the shade cloth. So apparently getting started, especially in the Mississippi heat, mm -hmm. could be trouble. But they have had a better summer this year than, yeah. you know, it could, then it could have been a lot hotter. It could have. <laughs> Good story. Well, we are at the Farm Week for this week. On our next show, we'll have an update on the Peterson brothers. They filmed a video at their Kansas their farm that went viral now with 9 million views. The brothers are using right? their notoriety to be advocates for agriculture. And the food factor. Know when to choose water over a sports drink. And in southern gardening, cold tolerant bananas. These bananas provide hardy tropical foliage. If you'd like further information on a farm week story or you want to suggest a story to us, you need to get in touch. You can find us on Facebook and YouTube. We're at Farm Week USA on Facebook. Our mailing address is Farm Week Box 9625, Mississippi State, Mississippi 39762. That's 9625, Mississippi State, Mississippi 39762. Our telephone number is 662-325-2262. You can also contact us through your county office of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. For the rest of the Farmer crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Amy Taylor. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next week.